Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. Nigeria's president, Good Luck Jonathan, hasn't enjoyed much in the way of good luck. Under his presidency, millions of people in northern Nigeria have been displaced, unique in the history of the country, even in the times of raging secessionist war. The specter of breakup haunts this African giant, the largest and richest country in the continent. Boko Haram, an Al-Qaeda-type insurgency group, have lifted their tactics from the burning alive of schoolgirls and churchgoers to full-scale assaults on police stations and army barracks, claiming thousands of lives, displacing millions, and promising even wars to come. A state of emergency was imposed nearly a year ago by the incongruously named President Goodluck, but it doesn't seem to be working. The threat grows ever larger and more violent. On top of all that, Nigeria is bracing for a food crisis. The very mixture, therefore, which 30 years ago made Ethiopia a byword for a state of collapse. Joining us on the Sputnik to discuss a subject largely ignored by the Western media is economist and financial expert Chidi Obihara. Chidi, thanks very much for coming on the Sputnik. Here we have an Al-Qaeda outfit, once thought to be venomous and wicked but small, now effectively creating a state of emergency in Africa's arguably biggest, most important country. Uh, and uh, millions of people displaced with a food crisis coming down the line. Uh, how that all uh, adds up to a bit of a disaster, no? Um, hello, George. <laughs> Thank you for having me on your show. Um, the, the, the theory that um, Boko Haram, uh, Nigeria's northeast separatist movement, is linked to um, Al-Qaeda is based on the supposition that a lot of weapons have come down from North Africa via the Islamic Maghreb um, after the demise of uh, Colonel Gaddafi. And that this, this loose link to um, Al-Qaeda is a, a driving force behind it. But many analysts in Nigeria are convinced that issues of, of poverty, desertification, um, and, and an imbalance in the economy with, with very poor transport links are the key causes rather than an international terrorist specter. I mean, are, it's a contributing factor, but I think it's a question of balancing both internal and external pressures. Because one hadn't hitherto imagined that Nigerian Muslims were particularly inclined to extremism of any kind. Are you really saying that this can be economically fixed? There's always been an appropriate stereotype that Nigerians will never kill themselves for anything. They're far more interested in making money, one way or other, than um, sort of sacrificing themselves for a broader ideological goal. It isn't part of the fabric of our society. I think that's one of the reasons why many Nigerians talk about the outside influences of the Islamic Negreb rather than the sort of interior uh, domestic uh, political drivers. But you make an extremely valid point about why it's important to develop the economic base and alleviate poverty of the country, both in the north and the south, as the most powerful tool against political opportunists, basically, who create movements like Al-Qaeda. Nigeria should be, of course, uh, extremely rich. Everyone should be living comfortably in Nigeria. If it weren't, weren't for poor governance and corruption and uh, previous uh, problems, uh, there would be none of this. But of course, there are secessionist tendencies latent within the state. I'm old enough to remember one in particular in Biafra, uh, which uh, raged uh, for years and which produced images of horror uh, that hadn't actually been seen since the end of the Second World War. You're confident that Nigeria can remain a single state, are you? But those are extremely powerful questions. Um, Biafra was a formidably ugly event uh, in global history, not just Nigerian history. Millions died. Uh, millions more were starved to death. And those images of starving children remain um, in many people's minds. 
Now, I think, ironically, one of the reasons why Nigeria probably will survive all this is that Nigerians do not want to go through mm. that kind of process again. again. Despite the fact that on this particular occasion, the secessionist sort of pressures are coming from very different parts of the country, by the way. But even this time around, we're all very, very clear that our strengths make us far more capable as a nation than our constituent parts alone. So within the context of solving this problem, good luck, Jonathan, um, our president has called together a constitutional group of 492 statesmen who are right now as we speak debating the future of the country, its constitution, and the way the federal government relates to the constituent state governments. The thrust of the, the, the conference is to talk about ways of structuring Nigeria so that we don't have individual groups of minorities who feel that they are not loyal to the center. Now, within that context, there have been lots of ideas, but one of the most powerful ideas is the idea that commerce, and ironically linking different parts of the country better, makes everyone aim for higher, mostly economic goals, rather than worry about being politically disconnected or disenfranchised. There was a specific group of people who've been talking about building Africa's first high-speed rail link. Now, I, I kid you not when I tell you this is a game changer, because along with the amazing economic news that comes out of Nigeria uh, on a daily basis, a high-speed train link in this part of Africa would change that sort of region forever. And I'm sure it would change the politics as well. So a constitutional convention is his first response. Mm -hmm. uh, the new economic policies, uh, his second response. Meanwhile, though, the insurgency continues. Are the security forces in Nigeria up to the challenge? There is a vicious rather than virtuous cycle in the way that the northeast of the country has tried to deal with this insurgency. But in specific examples of acts, for example, you know, the storming of the secondary school in Yobe, yes. um, where 30 teenagers were bound, gagged, and killed, um, the outrage the entire nation feels makes Boko Haram's activities overshadow their apparent goals. So you, you get to a situation where we stop talking about the causes of Boko Haram and the solutions of Boko Haram, and we transfix ourselves on the actual acts of Boko Haram, mm. and we need to move away from that. Mm. This year, we are rebasing our economy in Nigeria. So we're going from a uh, $260 billion economy to a $400 billion economy, potentially. Now, this will make the Nigerian economy bigger than, than Denmark, bigger than Switzerland, bigger than Singapore. I it's a game changer that juxtaposed against sort of political discourse almost dwarfs it. Because if you think about the idea that the world could be seeing its first middle-income African country uh, able to pull off big projects, employ millions of people, and trade and liberate those people, you begin to realize that we're actually facing something much wider and, as I say, game-changing than just solving a specific political problem. Is this president up to it? He hasn't declared whether or not he will run for president. He's quite clear uh, that the Constitution allows him to, but he hasn't said if he's going to run or not. Uh, I think it would be one of those episodes where someone as underrated as Goodluck Jonathan takes a challenging position and turns it into a spectacular opportunity. He could be the John Major of uh, Nigerian <laughs> uh, politics. He no, could be the Margaret Thatcher of Nigerian politics. <laughs> yeah, but uh, John Major was an unexpected uh, uh, um, Change treat. agent, yes. Yeah. Uh, now, we, we can't, beca because there is a danger mm -hmm. of a parallel universe uh, in this conversation, I'm with you, by the way, on everything that you have said, but there is a danger of a parallel universe because as all these high-speed rail links are being built and economic and constitutional change is busily being prepared. Even satellites, I believe. Absolutely, yes. Uh, yes. In the midst of all that, there's a full-scale war uh, going on. This is not a group of, uh, you know, 25 Red Brigade terrorists in, uh, in Italy mm. or uh, the Red Army fraction in Germany. This is an army uh, that is causing the displacement, as I said, of millions, is, has killed thousands. Mm is a real serious challenge to the uh, Nigerian uh, military. What do you know about this Boko Haram, and how do you therefore think we can see them defeated? Again, profound questions. Um, 
the theories about the formation of Boko Haram revolve around a man called Muhammad Yusuf. Um, apparently in 2002, he set up this resistance movement that was thought of at the time as being a sort of competition between the, the Kanuri uh, in Boronu and the Hausa in Sokoto. So it was, it was seen as really being a sort of a, a northern one-upmanship between two powerful uh, historic uh, uh, caliphates. Now, things changed a lot, though, um, because in 2007, 2011, the new government, which included Goodlock Jonathan, um, didn't win a lot of approval in the north as it took over. So there were some politicians in the north who said they were going to make Nigeria ungovernable. Mm. Boko Haram is about um, a local group in the northeast of Nigeria who have an agenda that's focused around bettering the northeast of Nigeria because they, they complain about poverty, rightly. They complain about corruption. And, and what's, what's come out of that entire process is this confusion, as I said earlier on, between the tactics and the acts of Boko Haram and the cause. If we encourage agriculture in this part of the country, which has been the staple for thousands of years, if we link it so that cultural produce can be exported from the coast, if we educate the population in a way that doesn't allow them to make statements like Boko Haram, you know, books are sinful. If we go through that structural change, try and imagine how impressive a country we could have. Well, I, I've always felt that Nigeria uh, could and I hope will be a very impressive country indeed. I, I have no doubt that the issues of poverty globally that cause people to adopt an inappropriate political stance uh, may affect Nigeria, but I'm an optimist. Absolutely an optimist. I could tell. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. It's Thank been you. great really to, nice to have, have you George. on the Sputnik. Coming up after the break is another optimist, the one and only Believe me, Max Kaiser, don't miss it. Hey, remember that Coen Brothers movie, No Country for Old Men? How about No Country for Young Men? What's the most you ever lost on a coin toss? What's the most you ever lost on a coin toss? You've been putting it up your whole life. You just didn't know it. Call it. Yeah, baby, call it. You stand to win everything. Call it. A top treasury official warns that Britain is teetering on the edge of dangerous housing bubble. And prices in London are rising so fast that Prince Charles says there isn't sustainability and risks driving away talented young individuals. In other words, this is no country for young people. Diplomacy led to breakthroughs in Syria and Iran, but it also strained relations between the US and Saudi Arabia. What does the future hold for Washington Riyadh ties? Cold War 2.0. There are those who claim the manufactured crisis in Ukraine is drawing new lines and defining new geopolitical realities. Others are dismissive. They say the old Cold War never really came to an end. So is Russia and the West doomed to be adversaries? Right from the sea. First rate news and eye gripping pictures. on our reporters' Twitter and Instagram. To be in the know, follow us online. Welcome back to the Sputnik. Our RT colleague, Max Kaiser, has become one of the most watched commentators on the globe. The Huffington Post calls him the most dangerous man in financial media. The Independent newspaper calls him America's most outrageous political pundit. And the Daily Dot calls him a sharp, articulate and narcissistic financial shock jock, punching above his weight. But before all that, Max invented the spiritual specialist technology that not only powers the Hollywood Stock Exchange, but also gave us one of the world's first virtual currency, the Hollywood Dollar. 
Now he's in the UK, not only hosting the Kaiser Report, but also launching several new companies, including the crowdfunding site StartJoin. Max's effervescence is not just the result of his unique personality, but an expression of the fact that he's almost literally bursting with ideas about the way things are and about the way things could be. It's a pleasure to welcome him aboard the Sputnik. Max We're Kaiser. actually in outer space? We're in and, outer space. We're orbiting the world. Orbiting the Earth. There are no this borders is, visible This is unbelievable. Down below us. I, I, this is in the technology like I would never have imagined it. <laughs> and of course, the Soviet Union beat your country uh, into Yuri, space. Um, Yuri Gagarin. Gargarian. I, I was in Fife uh, two days ago. Well, there's still a street called Yuri Gagarin. Who's the first Way. on the moon, George? First on the moon. Yeah, allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly, uh, although some people say it was a Hollywood film set or it was in the Arizona desert, but we'll not be distracted. I want to start. You, you came from a country, the United States, where if you fall down sick in the street, the doctor feels for your wallet before he feels for your pulse. And now you're here boosting the British National Health Service. Is this a revelation to you? Yeah, the NHS is a jewel, and I am part of the NHS because I live here now. And so the crowdfunding site that I've started called Start Join, Start a Revolution, Join a Revolution, is uh, putting together some funding for this film, Sell Off, uh, this NHS film. It's a brilliant film. I've seen a rough cut on it. And startjoin.com, the site, it's a combination. It's a revolutionary combination of crowdfunding plus cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I think this will be a huge revelation in both funding and finance, which puts power back into the hands of people who want to do things like transform the NHS, take power away from people like um, uh, Jeremy Hunt, for example. The uh, health secretary. The health secretary. And on that front, George, I, what I've come up with is an idea that I want to maybe fund on Start Join. This would be a, a, a pack of NHS terrorist playing cards. Now, you remember yes, back during yes. the Iraq war. Saddam Hussein and Tariq Aziz and the rest. Yes. So this is the prototype. So in other words, Jeremy Hunt, who's probably the number one. Public NH enemy number one in terms N of the National Health Service. NHS yeah. terrorist, yeah. Yeah. number one. He would be the ace of spades. Yeah. And then, of course, you have uh, McKinsey, uh, the, the consulting group, KPMG, Ernst & Young, PricewaterhouseCoopers. They're all these American consultants yeah. who have yes. flown into this country to basically like engage... Like vultures. They're, they're, they're vultures. They want to feast on what they hope will be a corpse of what was the greatest thing that Britain ever achieved. Right. There's 100 billion pounds in the NHS worth of assets. And they're engaging in what I would call pinata economics, where they're given a big fat stick. And they go to this uh, NHS, which is a treasure trove of assets. And their stick is given to them by this coalition government. And they beat the hell out of it looking for the candy. The candy is falling out. These things are being given to them free from the government. They borrow money free from the government at 0% interest rate. They break open, they pry open the NHS, and they award themselves all the assets uh, as, as reward, as lucre, in what is obviously a heist. So this film, which is sell-off, is trying to get the people in the UK to understand that this is it. This is the, land, uh, the line in the sand. You can't have our NHS. It's a brilliant uh, institution. And they need crowdfunding, and they get that through your StartJoin site, startjoin.com. That's great. The, uh, the, the crowdfunding business is becoming itself big business, you and I. Uh, have worked together on this uh, Tony Blair documentary, which is uh, gathering pace, I may tell you. We're also uh, working on a movie together about somebody the British public so far knows little about, but he's very, very important to the story of the last 20 years. Kenny Lay. Where's Kenny Boy? Tell us about it. Well, Tony Blair, remember, it wasn't blood for oil. Turned out it was blood for oil. And Ken Lay is kind of the American connection to this massive oil-empowered oligarchy that is plundering the world. Ken Lay, of course, former head of Enron. And Enron is really a seminal case of financial ter terrorism or financialization using corporate assets to create financial futures contracts, which dominate the energy industry and this, the tail wagging the dog. So you don't have genuine price discovery where the price of oil reflects true supply and demand, but it's the paper contracts that are driving the price. And the paper is driven by insiders who are manipulating the price to fund things like political campaigns for George Bush and others. So this is a story that we're going to go pursue. It's called Where's Kenny Boy? We're going to go to Paraguay. We're going to find Kenny Boy, which we think he might be still, we think alive, he's still alive, living in Paraguay, because that whole funeral situation seemed to be a big fake. Talk about the fake moon landing. This is, could be the fake Kenny Boy death. 
Uh, well, let, let, let's, for the benefit of British viewers, just uh, recap it quickly. This is a man who funded the George Bush neocon campaign. George Bush flew on an Enron jet into Florida for the controversial crisis, the recount over the Florida result when he was first elected. He was then, not Bush, but Lay, convicted of a vast fraud. Uh, but just before he could be sentenced and therefore his assets seized, he went off to Colorado and had a very convenient heart attack which meant his family could keep his wealth, and uh, he was quickly cremated before anyone from the federal government actually got a good look inside the coffin. And uh, as the smoke went up at the funeral, there was George Bush, George Bush Sr., even Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Donald Rumsfeld, they were all at the funeral of a convicted fraudster. And you and I think <laughs> he may not have actually been in that box. He may be where? Paraguay. So the concept for Where's Kenny Boy, this film that we're crowdfunding on StartJoin, is to have you, myself, and others go down to Paraguay and look for Kenny, Kenny, Ken Lay, which we think he's hiding out in, in this uh, Paraguay, in this, in this ranch, this estate somewhere. And of course, on our way there, we're going to be going through Texas. So we'll meet up probably with Alex Jones, <laughs> who's a friend of our show. And he's working on a show, a movie called, uh, with him right now, called Bailout 2, which is the sequel to Bailout, which is a film about the financial crisis. Uh, so we're trying to bring in the global crowdfunding community and the global crypto community, the Bitcoin community, the MaxCoin community. So people can donate with Bitcoin. Yeah, they can use Bitcoin. See, the thing about cryptocurrency, and when you combine it with crowdfunding to create this revolution, is that what's great about cryptocurrency is that people can mine their own currency. So in Iceland, when they went through an, a, a, a tragic financial crisis, they've now mined their own Aurora coin. Then they're distributing it to the people. And the people now have their new currency that's outside of the corrupt banking system. We see the same thing possibly in Scotland. We see the same thing happening in Spain. We see the same thing happening for the Lakota Nation in North America, who's been victimized by 300 years of broken treaties from the American government. They're now mining, crypto mining their own currency, the Meza coin, which is immune from any government over, uh, interference. So this is true independence, true financial independence, uh, which of course is the key toward true sovereignty. I told you he was bursting with ideas. The public, when they knew you were coming on Sputnik this week, are bursting oh with uh, questions. Well, CLF asks, how can the financial hegemony on politics be broken or at least contained? Well, I think we, now we are talking about this in terms of combining things like crowdfunding and cryptocurrency. Yeah. And I've already been through something very uh, interesting back in Hollywood. When I created the Hollywood Stock Exchange, it was considered so disruptive to the Hollywood establishment that they went after me in the same way they later went after Aaron Schwartz. I literally had to leave Hollywood to save my life because they had people following me, they, they were pursuing me because the technology of dis, uh, disrupting the Hollywood model with the Hollywood Stock Exchange mm. was so, uh, they were so frightened by this that they literally were, were people following me. And, and this I was a means by which the public could pick the winners. Yeah. Yeah? They, could, uh, they could, as it were, invest in rising stars and bring about the falling. I created the, the Hollywood, their, the own currency. It was like the first virtual currency. It has a patent on that currency. Uh, created the exchange, created the technology to trade these securities. So now suddenly the entire industry was in the hands of the public, mm. out, out, outside of the hands of the studios. And they uh, freaked out, essentially. They thought I was joking at first. But then when they realized that we had a million users and that the news was covering prices on the Hollywood Stock Exchange before the Hollywood news, before Variety, before um, mm. Hollywood Reporter, uh, they then went after me. More about currency. Um, uh, Rolf Semple asks, does he think, you, that the Russians and the Chinese will get together and form a new reserve currency? Will the Russians and Chinese form a new reserve currency? I think the more the U.S. Uh, tries to expand the hegemony of the U.S. dollar, the more they're forcing situations like Russia and China to come together and create maybe an asset-backed currency, a gold-backed currency. There's only three economies in the world left that are not completely controlled by the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. That's China, Russia, and Iran. Uh, the policy of the U.S. is to double down on all their mistakes in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere to try to carry forward the bad bet into leveraging a new country. We saw that in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. They were trying to take their roadshow of financial freedom into re Ukraine. It got rejected. So in, in betting circles, you would call this the martingale betting system, which is the idea that you can always bet on a losing bet if you're at the roulette wheel and you bet, and you, you bet on red and it's a loser, you double down. 
and you keep doubling down, the theory being that you will eventually win. It's called the Martingale betting system. Mm. The U.S. foreign policy is the same thing. They keep losing wherever they go, but they double down, double down, double down. The, the no, theory being that eventually they will win, but yeah. I think now they're at the wall where they're hit against China, Russia, Iran, yeah. and, and, the, and the casino's being shut down. Because if they get out of the dollar and they move into gold, the casino's shut and the U.S. You know, hits the skids. Well, uh, but it is uh, a pressing and urgent matter, isn't it? Russia is now being threatened with and in some, uh, to some extent already facing now sanctions. Uh, China will be next. Yet China holds more dollars than the United States Treasury holds. It's two and a half very powerful economies you're talking about there. Chinese, Russian, and Iran, they could have their own mm. currency, no? Mm. Well, actually, there's this very specific question about that from Robert saying, will China act to kill the dollar? or live with being encircled by the U.S. expanding deficit-funded military. Oh, that's a good point. I mean, the, the, the threat to China is very real yeah. and present. Yeah. Why well, doesn't they, China yeah, take this they, opportunity? Yeah, they, hold their they, they have been taking this opportunity. Over the last five years, both China and Russia have been buying record amounts of gold. So as the paper world, of the, America's a paper empire mm. built on fiat mm. currency. Mm. And if you don't buy their bonds, they bomb you. So That's they, America's foreign they're policy. They're the paper, the paper tiger. Right. Yeah. <laughs> if you, if, now, if, if suddenly, if, they, if they're yeah. going to say, we're not going to take that paper anymore, and the world shifts from a paper-backed currency to re resource-backed currency or gold-backed currency, then the U.S. is going to be holding a, a very poor hand in that geopolitical situation. They're going to be holding a pair of twos against Russia, China, Iran. We'll be having, you know, four yeah. aces yeah. of gold. And they've been buying gold in record amounts. That's why gold prices have been inching up, you know, for the last five, ten years. Uh, in the last two years or three years, gold has been subjected to the same kind of market manipulation that I talked about earlier in the show, where the paper price of gold is knocked down with paper futures contracts that they're financed with 0% interest rates. But once that game ends, you see a gap in gold. Gold moves up to two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 an ounce. Suddenly, he who has the most gold is making the rules. That would be China, Russia, and their friend Iran. The Australian comedian asks, what kind of coffee do you drink? And can it be uh, in UK water supply to live up the masses? Well, usually I like to take uh, an Arabica, um, Arabica bath. So I draw a bath and I fill my entire bathtub with uh, black <laughs> with espresso. Caffeine. And then I just I, 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 I slip into that bath. And sometimes I'll and just com it. completely underneath the bath. And before I leave the house, I try to drink the entire <laughs> bath of coffee. And that usually gives me enough energy to get to the studio. Well, that explains a lot and gives our people the answer. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for this week. You know how to reach us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik. And on Facebook, you can like us on Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway, it's been marvelous. Bye, y'all. <laughs>